Gap commercial and says, will you buy you? And I screamed. I screamed. Because it was one of those moments that only if you know, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Can you talk story. about that yeah, whole LL? Yeah. Let me tell you a funny Wait, story. Wait, but before that. you look at does anybody else remember that when LL did the Gap commercial mm -hmm. wearing food? Like, how mm -hmm. is that even possible? Well, he wasn't yeah. wearing food, but he was wearing Gap, but he no, said, he was wearing food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, we yeah. had on, right? Yeah, right. What happened with that was that we were, we were all in the office. This is when we were on the 48th floor. We had a, a little office, maybe a little bigger than this room. What are you saying about Billy's house? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> this <is a> big house. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying that the office was, you know, we had this. As soon as you walked in, it was the yeah. secretary desk there. It was two offices here. And there was a showroom right here, two showrooms right here. But it, the, the lobby was no bigger than this. And... We were we all in the we didn't have any desks like that. <laughs> we were just in the in the in the lot in the um, conference room sitting down around each other, around the table. And the phone rang, I pick up and it's um one of uh LL's right hand guys, Ralph Roundtree. So he called me, he's like, Hey, listen, um, I got a question for you. LL's doing this gap commercial and he wants to wear the full hat because I ain't got no hats to put on. You know how to be weird? Hell no. <laughs> Hold on one second. I hung up the phone and I looked. I said, yo, Elle's doing that guy commercial. He want to wear the football hat. So Damon, you know, Damon, his his his, his <laughs> dog, whatever, he was like, oh, hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> like, what, right now? I was like, right now. They shoot it right now. So I got, put Ralph on the speaker. I said, Ralph. I got everybody in the room tell me what you said. He said, you know, he's doing the, the, the Gap commercial. He wants to use the hat because they have no hats to fit his head. Huh? So he was like, this oh, is you know. Yeah, no problem. This is a true story. But, um, you know, so that was that's how that became about. And then we didn't know that he was going to rap about it. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting around and, and Gap, and at that time, Gap had like, I think, maybe a 20 or $40 million dollar, um, commercial budget that they were putting out they, because they put out L, they put out a bunch of other people. I think somebody went before one or two people, artists or, or, or celebrities went before L and then it was L's turn. So when I saw that commercial come up and he was like, for us, buy us on the low, I mean everybody's mouth just dropped. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember that. Yo! Did he, oh, they gonna cut that, man. They gonna cut that. <laughs> we were like, they gonna cut it, they gonna cut it, you know, and that's all we kept thinking about how they were gonna, like, just stop that commercial from airing because they were gonna figure it out. But nobody yeah. figured it out. Mm -hmm. you we know, did. You know, like you said, people who knew, knew. But, you know, you got a bunch of people that got food. Who didn't realize what he right, said. Right. You know, they just thought he, oh, it was nice. Right, right, right. 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 They didn't know what he said. But that's, you know, when, when once that happened, we were sitting there like, oh man, this is this is crazy. And then they continued to run it and oh, run it. Yeah. And I people was going that. to the gap. I got boo boo in there. <laughs> <laughs> and people was like, what the hell? Is that? Right. We saw LL with Boo Boo on. He was like, oh, okay. And then somebody, I guess, got in somebody's ear. Um, I think a couple people lost their jobs. It's not my fault. <laughs> I just gave the approval. <laughs> I should have had a hat to fit his big head. <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of like what happened with that whole story. I, I love that story mm -hmm. because it, that goes back to if you're from our space, mm -hmm. you know what he said the second he said it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it just goes right over people's heads. So I'm happy that Gillian mentioned that because that's one of the things that you and I had kind of talked about, like how FUBU, for lack of a better term, was able to kind of infiltrate. Like there, there was, how you, you were know, able to get in. You know what, it, it, it started to, with all that starting and stopping that we did, and that late work that we put in, and that blood, sweat, and tears, like I always, when I go around and speak to kids, I say, listen, how many of you guys have worked for free for four years? Mm, not me. <laughs> <laughs> not one hand up in here came up, but not one hand, hand in, in, you know, in the classroom comes up either. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, because when we started, we didn't get a check. We didn't get nothing. We might have got, they might have took us out to eat every once in a while, but he worked at Red Lobster, so it was just some But, you know, we saw the big picture. Sometimes you have to see the big picture. You know, people sometimes only see things for face value. They don't. They can't see around it, or they can't see down the road. And we saw down the road, and then just from all the negativity that we was getting, it just gave us energy because everybody said we couldn't do it. But every time we went out, where there was a, a black expo, that's what we used to do, all the black expos yeah. everywhere, in Washington, Virginia, mm -hmm. Philly, New York, just those surrounding states that we can get to. But every time we would go to a black expo, we would sell out. We were coming in, I'm talking boxes and boxes of, so t-shirts, and with the time we we left, we had nothing. We 
you had nothing left, and people, where can I buy it from? Where is it at? There's no way but here. Mm -hmm. So we used to have people come back the following year, like, man, I waited all year to get back here so wow. I could get this wow. T-shirt. Wow. You know, and then we were like, man, we got something. We just got to get in the store. We got to get in the store. And this one guy on the avenue who we used to buy all our clothes from, um, Sasson, this guy, I mean, Syrian dude, he was, he was like a blessing, you know. And we went up to him one day, and we was like, listen, we shop here all the time, but we got some shirts, you know. We, we just give you 30 shirts. Just put it in there. Just, you know, when it sells, you just call us. So he put the shirts in there, and then one, I think it was like a week, Boom, he was gone. He called us back the next week, like, I need some more shirts. He was like, I need some more shirts. We ran back down there, and then he just, he was the only person who had it, so wow. he just made a ton of money off of it. And then, you know, we were the first person to be in the Macy's window, the first urban designer to be in the Macy's window. We were actually in the window mm -hmm. ourselves before they put the clothes in the wow. window. We were actually Impressive. sitting in the window talking to people outside. Mm -hmm. I got pictures mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know me. I was going to have a big old screen up. Come back to Tango. But, you know, it, it, it's like a, a, lot of, a lot of those things were, were, were instrumental in us building our brand and being as big as it was because without that legwork that we put in, we wouldn't have never had that rush to the stores. Like people would come into the stores. I mean, sellouts, sell-throughs was like at 25, 35% wow. a week. Mm -hmm. You know, usually you get eight, ten percent, you good, but we used to get like 35 and it just hovering around 20, 25. And then he was like, oh man, we can't keep none of this in the store. So all that late work, you know, hard work does pay off. Mm -hmm. I'm attest to it. But you know, without all that work, we wouldn't have a Never been I think, I, I mean, obviously I want to take questions from anybody that has a question, but I think it's really important, just even as you spread your message and, and really take larger stages with your message, that people really understand the biggest takeaway is the fact that you had to be persistent. And I think a lot of times right now, everybody wants instant. Like right yeah. now, right now, right now. Or, you know, we're in New York, everybody wanted it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I hurry up and wait, or, you know, whatever that is. And, you know, again, from a consumer, I didn't see all of that. Mm -hmm. How are you able to endure that starting and stopping? I'm an entrepreneur, and this room is full of entrepreneurs. I started and stopped, and, you know, you have children. You get, you know, like, how did you endure that whole start yeah, and no, stop? It, it was hard because we didn't want to stop. We were just forced to stop. Right. We, couldn't, we didn't have any money to go further, mm -hmm. and we just had to figure it out. So, you know, I used to manage... Um, you know, I was when I, like I said, when I was 17, I, I skipped this story. <laughs> but when I was 17, and I bust my face open, I had to get myself together, and I said, you know what? My mother said it. I told her, I said, listen, they got this co-op program in school. Let me get in co-op. Is this way I can go to school a week, and I can work a week, and then I can bring some money home, and I can help, you know, help me with the bills. So she was like, well, anything to keep you behind in school, because. <laughs> I was like one foot out, one foot in, and I was telling King earlier, you know, I used to go to school drunk every day. Yeah. Like, I get up and I have a 40 on the way to school, and when I got to school, I get a tall can and put it in the bag and go to, in school and be in class sipping, and I look over and Damon's sipping here. And like, okay, I ain't the only one in here sipping. But, you know, it was so hard to, to I felt at that time, to get over that hump. but. With that class and that, that program, that, that really that really helped me out a lot because I wouldn't have never made it without that program, you know. And when I got that, you know, when I got finally got a job, and I got a job for work, working at um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development at 17, you know, almost 18, but I was like 17 still. And I worked there for about a year and a half, not even a year and a half, about a year. And um, there was some discrepancies with one of the the files or whatever this guy was trying to get over. He wasn't providing the right paperwork. Long story short, he was Jewish. My boss was Jewish. I was black. So black man got kicked out. <laughs> I got fired. No. It was a black lady named Evelyn King. I'll never forget her name. And she loved me. She used to tell me every day, you look just like my son. Come here, give me a kiss. You look just like my son. She I'm just like, wanted to kiss like I'm you. like, Jesus, you gonna tell me every day? <laughs> but when she heard what went down, like everybody was really upset about it because it was like, you only did your job. How could they fire you when this guy is clearly trying to get over? You have to provide the paperwork or you don't get the credit. Period. He didn't provide it. He shouldn't have got the credit. Mm -hmm. So 
she said, I got something for you. You know, I got my boy out in, you know, his private in the street, and I'm going to talk to him to see if he can get you in there. So I said, okay, whatever you, whatever you can do. I got fired on June 2nd, 1989, <laughs> and I got hired June 12th, 1989. So it took me about 10 days between that job and that job, and then I was working for, you know, running, whether it's buildings or whatever. Like, I had a whole block full of 200 apartments. Wow. And on 135th Street, I went from rental assistant to office assistant to assistant manager in six months. Wow. Because wow. I was just that quick with the, you know, I knew how to do it behind the scenes. So when I got to the place, it was easy. It was like, oh, the same, right? The same, right? Right. But, you know, and then when I turned 19, um, my boss said, listen, I might have something for you. You know, let me see. You know, give me a couple months to work it out. So as soon as I turned 20, he's like, I got a, a manager's position. You ready? You, you want it? I'm like, <laughs> I'm on the phone because that's like, that's the, all the pressure from the job is on the manager. So I'm like, and I'm 20 years old, and I'm like, yeah, 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 I, I'll take it. He's like, you sure? I said, yeah, man, I'll take it. I said, listen, just give me three months. Just coach me for about three or four months, and then I should be good. Did that prepare you for some of the pressures that you would face once FUBU really took off, like how much preparation do you feel was instinct or how much of it was actual preparation through work experience? Or is with it just Fugu, in your you know, with Fugu, it was it was more like a slingshot because everything that came to us, it was either first, it was, we were the first to do it, and we didn't really know how to do it. Right. So even Damon, he, you know, we got to the job and once we got, you know, in the Fugu, he was like, you came late, you fired. I said, Damon, you, you, you talk to the boy. <laughs> he got to be here at a certain time. And, you know, you, it's certain things right. you have to set up. So I had to kind of teach him right. how to be a CEO. Right. You know, and then he caught on quick. He, he grabbed it quick and he got it. And he was like, okay, so I got to give him a letter first. And I got to warn him. <laughs> like yeah, right? I got to warn him a couple of times. Then I can fire him. I said, exactly. So then we started to, you know, the bond like that. But a lot of things that we, we did was, was, it was just like, Mm -hmm. We had no time to prepare because we were kind of first doing it. So, But I think that also speaks, as we begin to wind down, I'll definitely open the floor up to questions. I think that speaks to pretty much everybody that's mm -hmm. in this room. Like, I'm sure, I, I'm looking at all of the faces in this room, and there are a lot of people in here who did things first. You know, just as I don't have anybody, like, how do you run a speakers agency? I'm sure you didn't have anybody to help you do it. Like, we all were in that same boat, and I think a lot of it, I think a, a, the big, a big piece that we miss as entrepreneurs is that a lot of it is instinct. You know, you can read textbooks and go and get an MBA, but if you don't have it in your gut to be able to make those decisions at that pivotal moment, that's the differentiating factor, in my opinion, for success. And the fact that you can now look back in 2013, they're like, yo, in 91, we did this, 94, we did. And a lot of it, I'm listening to you, and like, we didn't know what we were doing, but we figured it out. You know what, too? It, it was with us, it was, um, you know, like I said, we were the first to do it, and we had no training. The only person that really had any training was Jay, and he just went to FIT, mm -hmm. so he knew how to design, and right. he didn't know how to prepare us for a lot of the, the things. And then what helped us is we really thought out of the box. So we would bring some crazy idea into this company and be like, listen, we should do it like this, it's gonna work. You know, because even when we were, you know, putting out the shirts and, and we had about seven, ten pieces. We was in like 40 videos with the same shirt. People thought we had shirts. We would take them when we take them to the set. Hey, put this on. Moni, Moni Love, here, put that on. And, and, and rock that. And then we come back and that on. Hey, we're going to see you some shirts, girl. Right? And then we would go back. And then that's how we would do it. We would run back and forth. And people thought we had this huge company. So smoking mirrors, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But show of hands, how many of those have, 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 have no well, that's, that's a lot of hands back there. That's how you got to do it, and that's how we did it. And, and, but a lot of that out of the box. Of thing. Even when we, right. when we first started, the first years, we get there, we're like, okay, people are like, oh, you need a marketing person, you need a PR person. You need, we know what the hell these people do. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, no, we do that. We do all of that. <laughs> so we sat down with this big... I ain't gonna say no names, but this big marketing um, advertising agency, actually. And they came to us and they were like, okay, well, it's for you guys, and you know, we can do this. And they start dancing around the world, and we're looking at them like, what 
in the hell? <laughs> do they understand what we what we doing? Like, like what we were trying to go with this? And at that time, no one understood us. Right. So a lot, everything you see as far mm -hmm. as advertising, mm -hmm. marketing, branding, whatever, commercials, videos, we did everything ourselves. We sat right. around that table and created everything ourselves. You know, it's, with the help of Pipe Williams, because he's a little cuckoo. Pipe Williams is the video director. Yeah, the video director. He, he hit us one time. Listen, he hit us one time. He said, he said, how you want to do this ill commercial? We don't know. We just want to do something really over the top. And he's like, well, what's the concept? We said, we're coming out with this new line. And he was like, all right, give me a minute. <laughs> he said, he's like, blue water. That's it. <laughs> so me and David are like, blue water? What about blue water? He's like, just blue water. Trust me, blue water. You know, we're sitting there like, hey, what are you telling us? Like, what are you, what, what's going on? So he's like, I got you, I got you. So we're like, and then I looked at David, I said, David, what's wrong with how you man? What are you supposed to? He's like, man, I, listen, I don't trust him. He's a genius. He's crazy, but he's a genius. We're going to trust him, and we'll see what he's talking about tomorrow. He came back tomorrow. He said, listen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot an underwater fashion show. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody remembers this commercial, but we had women in this Olympic-sized pool, fully dressed. They had to swim down to the bottom of the pool and walk on the runway. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. Down I remember that. Yeah, he had to walk on the runway, and some of the girls couldn't hold their breath long enough <laughs> to do it. So we would just catch them coming in the water. You just see them like you see girls just like skating in the water. Those are the ones who couldn't get this down. This is on video. Bottom. Keep just went like this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's that's some of the things that Hype helped us create. Right. You know, he helped us shoot Fatty Girl, which is oh, wow. And yeah. even with that, you know, just putting that together. You know, when we did the record labels, it was we wanted to figure out another avenue that we can market ourselves besides being in the video. So we said, okay, if we start a record label, then we can have the people talk about us on the records, and then it'll be forever. It will be more, you know. So we always thought about different things outside of the box, and that's, that's how we were able to become successful. Well, I, wow. I was definitely a FUBU fan buying my 10-year-old a $90 sweatshirt. <laughs> so I hope uh, but hey, listen, you listen, probably listen. put a pool in your we house. Put, we put all that money in that sweatshirt. That was probably one of the warmest sweatshirts he ever had. And he, he, did, he did cherish it. All the other ones went under his bed and the closet, but he had his FUBU sweatshirt. So he was there. And I was mommy of the week, I think, that week. Yes, can go. Yes, can go. Let me find out if you have a question. I, I, I have two. Oh, you ready? You ready for these questions? It's simple. The name FUBU. How did that come about? We know what it means, but how did y'all come together and go, that's well, what it's going we to be? Well, we were sitting around the house, and I never forget, we were in the living room, and um, we were like, we need a name, you know, that will work for, you know, we... See, well, back then, it was the four-letter name, Puma, Nike, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Coca Cola, you know, everything was four letters. Mm -hmm. So we were like, we need a four letter word. And then um, we all sit around the house. He was like, man. And we was reading this um, this New York Times article about how Timberland mm -hmm. didn't want the urban kids wearing their boots. Yes. Right. Yes. And when we looked around the house, and we were like, everybody had on Timberland. And we were like, why would a company say that? You're getting all of this money. Why would you say that to? the kids in the urban communities and they're buying all your stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's like, man, we need to make some stuff that's by us and that's for us, man. You give me all the money, man. <laughs> Somebody said, well, buy us for us. He said, buy us for us. Well, we got a short, it got to be four letters. Boofu. <laughs> <laughs> nah, boofu ain't gonna work. So we're like, we're like, for us, buy us. Boofu. Chinese, see? <laughs> 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 so I think it could work, you know, and then we played around with it, and we just, that's how, that's how it's stuck. Mm -hmm. But isn't that organic? Like, just how stuff comes in such an organic way? Yeah, and, and I'm surprised it came, because even when we try to think of names later on in life, we took, took us months, months. Like, I'm surprised that came to us so fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, second one is uh, a photo that someone sent to me about a year or so ago. And when I saw it, I was extremely proud 
of you, and I want you to explain this to me, because you're my boy. But when I saw this, I was like, really, here? Uh, it was a photo of the four of you guys, but you were, uh, what is that, like Mad Madame Toussaint, like when they do the, the wax, wax figure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I was yeah. like, really? So explain that, never asked you about that. So how did that come about, and was that even well, real? I was like, is this real? It's real. It's in real. You're in wax? Yeah, yeah. Madame Tussauds? Yeah, not in Madame Tussauds, but it's in um, the Great Blacks and Wax Museum. They call, oh, they call it the yeah. International Wax Museum now in Baltimore. Both, okay. yeah. Where they have the slavery yeah. ships and whatnot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. wow. Blacks and Wax. How do I yeah. know that? Yeah, I was right. proud of you, my dude. When I saw it, I was like, why? Yeah. I haven't been there, but I've been there. I've been there in Rutgers. It was yeah. funny because one day, you know, we got a call and, and they said, I never forget my, my publicist comes running in. She was like, "Listen, now when she gets hyped, mm -hmm. talk like this. Talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> this. Daddy, come in here, sit down." We like, "What happened, Lance? What's going on?" Sit, sit, sit down. So we sit down, and she's like, "I got the greatest news you ever want to get today." So we're like, "What happened, man? They gonna put y'all in wax figures?" I was like, "Who who in wax figures?" <laughs> Where? Madame Tussauds? She was like, no, 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 not Madame Tussauds, but up in Baltimore, I'm in Baltimore. Yeah. And then I was like, well, shoot, this is wax figures and wax figures, you know? <laughs> and we finally, after they called us and we went up there, and I, and I remember I was like, I was, I was heavy back then, because my, my wax figures were big. <laughs> <laughs> big with braids and everything, but it was funny because I, we went up there and they, they measured us, and the whole time I was just like, Real? Wow. Then they said, okay, well, we need some money to help fund it. I was like, oh, I knew it. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We ain't gonna never be in it. They just took our stuff and they're gonna hold us for ransom. <laughs> but they wound up raising the money and they put us in there and they said, I have to get this, still get there. Yeah. Just you really? haven't seen it? No, no, no. Yes. I, mean, oh, oh, wow. I got some of my wife, I got all the pictures and people sending them to me. Right. But my wife, I told her, like, what, last week? I was like, oh, oh, we gotta go, I gotta schedule a trip. Shotgun. That's, yeah, that's yeah, history, that. though. Like, that's that's yeah. 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 I gotta take a picture with it. I didn't even take a picture. Good question, right? I didn't hurt you, right? Okay, I'll cut you the check later for your question. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was real. I was wondering if you could give us just a little bit of insight in the transition from you know doing the shirts yourself to figuring out how to create you know thousands of these things and how, how to go well, from a small shop to that you know what yeah, that you scale actually doing the shirts yourself was the hardest part because we we didn't know what fabric we were what I remember one time we put something together and it burped up or something like that <laughs> and baby was like oh this fabric's no good we gotta throw this away it's catching on fire so we took it out, we had a big barrel, and we put it in the backyard, and we burnt it. And, you know, it created this huge smoke, and the fire department came, and it <laughs> shut us down. It's like, you cannot burn stuff. You heard it here first, everybody. He's like, you cannot burn <laughs> stuff like this out here. So what happened was, after, you know, doing it ourselves, and then you had a couple of ladies help us sew the clothes, because Damon was so actually doing the sewing, and it just became too much for him to, to do it all. So we hired about three or four ladies to come help us sew. But the transition from where we was at to, to like to Samsung, they were already in the textile business. They already had the connections. They already been doing it. You know, they had the, the overseas connection. So everything was kind of set up. All we had to do was bring them out blueprint and say, boom, this is how we want you to make it. It needs to be this size, this size. You know, it needs to fall like this, fall like that. And it was pretty much. After that, was, once we got funding, it was it was over. Money changes things. How about that? <laughs> How about it, it, that? Became, it became easier a little bit because we were actually we had people to help us put it together and really understand. Okay, what is the armhole supposed to be, and what's your chest? Because we never do anything of that, uh, like that. If you ever see our clothes, our clothes are so damn big. I pulled out the shirt the other day. I said, "Man, you see this two X?" <laughs> I was holding it like this. I was like, "God, man!" Um, <laughs> but you know, we didn't know what we were doing. But we made it like that because we wanted to fit. Like we made the rise of the pants longer because of, you know, just black people got butts. And, you know what I'm saying? And we didn't want no tight jeans. And we did. We added little things ourselves, and then we just carried that over to what we were doing with Samsung. And they actually provided all the. Manufacturing and all that for us, so it was pretty easy after that. Oh, Anybody else? You got him here now, you better ask, because after tonight, I'm charging. Oh, that's <laughs> <a charge. laughs> sure, yeah. Well, it's not really a question, but um, I'm going to just 
give a testimony to what my man's been saying. So I don't know if this is information. I'm just sharing. As far as the stories, I'm sitting here. I'm so proud of you too, like Kango. Yeah, I really know Damon. I know all four of y'all. But when he talked about persistence, I'm going to definitely tell you persistence is what got these cats here because I want to put my man on the spot, my man over here, chill well. <laughs> and Doug, he like, right? Doug had a video Thanks, shoot on, on, the, on the West Side Highway on the boat for this video call. It's on. It wasn't his most popular song, but we, ran, we walked up to the boat. Jay is there. And for the whole shoot, Jay is just getting on my nerves. Yo, get these cats to wear my shirt. We get these in the video. And I'm like, yo, though, we just. I, I don't know how much I can do it. I'm just here with my man. And you got, I'm just hanging out. And I'm telling you, for the whole shoot, man, I was never so... Assaulted? You know, so spent. It's felt like I was working for y'all. I'm like, this chat, I'm like, yo. So that really goes to show, man, hard work really does pay off, man. And I'm so proud of y'all, man. So that's one of many. I don't want to take up the whole room, but sitting here and listening to you talk was like, yo, I got a couple of stories firsthand. One thing I, I would always remember reading and thinking bro Rich, it was like, it was this, this, um, this phrase that says, you know, some people don't know how close they come to, to success because they all quit. Yeah. Mm. And that's just so true because we knew, like even with all the naysayers around us, every time we went to that Black Expo and we sold out, we played, we got something, right. they don't know what it is, mm -hmm. we ain't going to listen to these cats because right. these cats is buying it yeah. and you know and all the cats that weren't buying it or were telling us that we weren't going to make it was all our homeboys or right. guys around the neighborhood you know just the haters so yeah. we saw these cats out here that was every time we you know we go to a show we would have we would finish and, and sell out everything and have people come like don't tell me you out <laughs> don't tell me you out <laughs> and you're like what the hell like we couldn't believe it like these people love the shirts that much and we were like wow this must be something yeah, we just got to get it out there and then once, once we finally got it out there and hit the stores yeah. it's gone it's crazy it's gone but we built a, the thing that we did early and like i said everything was kind of out of the box because we built an overseas market before we even had a u.s market but we were selling to japan the stuff that we were making. So by the time it, it hit, you know, us, and then we was able to, to get it out to the people in America, Japan already knew about it, mm -hmm. you know? So as soon as we got established here, it was like, I think the next year, we just, we started opening up stores and stuff overseas. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we did that for a lot. Did one of the stores I'm most proud of is we opened one in Milan. Wow. You know, and I was like, we have one in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I was like, they wear food in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> right. I didn't even know they wore food in Saudi Arabia. Right. But, you know, it's just a lot of places that Mexico City, mm -hmm. I mean, full fledged food stores. Mm -hmm. like, we have it, you know, all the pictures in, back in the office. And I'm just like, you know, sitting in that house on farms, you know, sewing, sewing machines and running back to anybody. Hey, you got some boxes? Come on, let's go. And we trying to sell it and trying to put it on people and the resistance and, you know, some from stores or whatever, to actually have a food store. You know, it's I'm walking down, I'm in Japan, I'm walking down the block. I went out there to, uh, I went out there to open that, that store too, but I walked down there, and it's a two-story huge building. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> John Jefferson, what's going on? What's going on? Like, it was just, you know, just crazy, you know. But like I, I said, think, work does pay off. I think it yeah. just speaks to um, why people are so interested in your story at this point. At least, you know, I was extremely interested because, you know, you see these stories and we can all go to Wikipedia and you can read about it. But to be able to come on a night like tonight and actually hear it from you, jokes and all, or these school, I'm going to get you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that's the, but that's the thing, like jokes and all, like to real to look at you from a three hundred and sixty degree perspective, because so many people might think they know who you are from what they read or what they saw, but to be able to see you here in a really intimate setting and listen from your mouth, I, I think it's it's a tribute to the people that came out this evening. It's important. You, you know what? We we never were just able to tell our story, our personal story. Now you we, can. <laughs> yeah, now we can, but we were never able to express that. It was always business, food. We kept it in that. Don't ask me about my wife. Don't ask me about this. Right. Don't ask me about another. You talk about food. That's it. Right. So now it's it's almost refreshing to, to get it out and let people know, you know, a lot of the things that they've never heard before. Mm 
Well, I'm, I'm grateful, and I think, you know, he deserves an amazing round of applause. Your ability to share, and I think even when we're looking at where our young people are, you know, you said you're, you were 19, you know, my youngest son right now is 19, and, you know, what do these young people now have to look up to? So I think it's so important that you're able to tell your story, and they can see you, and you look like them, and you talk like them, and you are them, you know, you're saying this is where I'm coming from, and this is what I have to say. Because a lot of times when you bring people who have achieved a certain level of success, they are in that box. They're very stodgy and they're, you know, go to college and you're like, nah, you know what, there's another route. Try yes. this way. And I think that makes such such a difference in the lives of young people. So I, I look forward to booking you for many more speaking engagements. And Sorry, you know, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to say I think also on behalf of all the entrepreneurs and some it is people a lot in this room here. have already been highly successful and everything like that. I think it's really important to see and meet you and hear those stories because a lot of us are going through the same things that you guys went through, you know, trying to get that breakthrough, you know, mm -hmm. like going through X amount of years, starting, stopping, different transformations. Mm -hmm. you know, I tell life, people today that they try like to that, start you know? a call and don't do it. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you say that. Because the reason I said that is a lot of times people don't do their homework. You know, they want to they want to put a name on the shirt and put it out there, and a couple people buy it. All of a sudden, oh, I'm gonna start this corner line. But that's not that's not it. You know, and that's where you waste a lot of money. What people usually do is they go buy a bunch of cheap shirts, put their name on the shirt, rip the tie off the shirt, stick their label in there. But the shirt is still a cheap shirt. Mm. So you have to understand the branding aspect of it because if somebody if somebody gives you that, if I sell you that shirt and you go home and you love it and you wash it one time and the shirt is ruined, yeah. mm. I need to that's your name yeah. that they will associate that shirt with. Oh, I bought this FUBU shirt and man, I washed it one time and it fell apart. Right. Because it wasn't a FUBU shirt. It was somebody else's shirt that I put FUBU on it and... I tried to sell it to you as mine, yeah. which I sold it to you, bought it, but now you'll never buy nothing from me again. And that's what happens, and, and you need a lot of money and a lot of the right connections. Like when I consult people, I tell them, listen, it's not about how much money you got because, you know, you can have $2 million, I'll show you how to blow that real quick, mm -hmm. you know? But if you don't have the right <clears throat> connections for our manufacturing, and, and the most important thing is distribution. That's the most important thing. I don't care if it's records, music, liquor. I don't care <laughs> what it is. It's distribution. And, you know, there was a time when, when we, we got caught up. And if we weren't so big and so popular at the time, we would have sunk because it was a, it was a, we had a shipment on, 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 on water that was coming over from, from China. And we had to have it by a certain day. It didn't get to us to about three weeks after that date. Now, that date is the cutoff date. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in the stores, mm -hmm. and in places like Macy's or department stores require six weeks before that, mm -hmm. your stuff needs to be in there mm -hmm. so that they can get it on the floor in those six weeks. So what happened was we missed that date, and it came in like, I think it was like August 23rd, if I remember correctly, somewhere around there. and. We went back to the stores. We was like, hey, listen, stuff came in. And I was like, oh, sorry. You both, we sold. Wow. So this one was $50,000. And this one was two hundred. We were like, listen, in. oh, I only got $20,000 for you. So right then and there, you start losing money. This one had $200,000 for you. Now he only got twenty. Mm -hmm. This one had fifty. Now he only got fifteen hundred. You know what I'm saying? So then now you start. Now all this million dollars or two, three million dollars you had now is turned into two hundred and fifty thousand dollars So what happened to the shipment, though? Like, was the It was shipment late. Wow. It came, but it was late. It missed that date, and you couldn't do nothing with it, but put it in TJ Maxx, Mall Shoes, and try to salvage it, which we did. And we, we know we made a couple dollars off it, but we made sure that the next time we were early, you know, and that starts with the designers, you know. Getting stuff and, done. And, and customs. Yeah, customs, everybody. all the all the. You got to give yourself variables. time. And then, you know, people, like I said, they, they want to go out there and produce these lines, and really, they don't do their homework. They don't know what the market is missing. They don't know if their product is what, what's needed out there. You just can't just do a shirt and just put a shirt out there and think you're going to have a clothing line. Perfect example. Eminem sold 10 million records this year. 
It's one year. Mm -hmm. Right? Got a diamond in it. Right? Oh, this guy's the crazy rapper ever. Da, 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 da. I want to put out a clothing line. So he puts out Shady. Mm. Shady couldn't sell Shady mm -hmm. if Shady tried to sell Shady. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't work. It, it wasn't there. First of all, you're good over here. You're great over here. This is a whole nother ball game. Even right. with us with records, we, we figure, okay, we make all this money. We, we, these cats, all these Becky cats puff and Jay, they gonna jump into the fashion game, and we gonna jump into their game. Right. But it's totally different. You know, you go into that, that arena, there's this haters, there's blockers, there's people who don't want to see you succeed. And, you know, it was a lot of like that. Like, guys were selling us songs that they didn't even own. Mm. Wow. wow. Well, we had to cancel checks on the fly. Like, listen, cancel that check. He's a, he's a thief, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it's a little little things in the music industry that we didn't know about. Right. And it's, it's dirty in the music industry. It's mm -hmm. a no joke, you know, mm -hmm. but we figured we had enough money, we can go in there. I mean, we made an impact, and we did, but after that first album, it was like, man, we're going to go back and make clothes, clothes on high school for a band, make <laughs> <laughs> no money for their baby mama, make <laughs> no money, get out of jail. Yeah. It's just none of that. Right. Just right. make the shirt, sell the shirt, make the money. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. water. I mean, this is this is his story is so indicative of. That's a short story. <laughs> I mean, I, his your story is so indicative of all the stories of all the speakers that I work with that have so much to say. I mean. I see people on the floor like sitting at your feet to hear what you have to say because you can't learn this from an Ivy League school. Like this mm. is hands on, this is how we did it, this is the grunt work and this is how we were able to endure and you can't learn that from a book. So and one of the things that I shared when I was doing my pitch to keep to come to my agency as opposed to somebody else's is you know, President Obama has major initiatives right now to bring people like Keith into schools because right now they're understanding that there's this huge gap that's taking place from what students, graduating students, are actually learning and then how do you apply that in real life because we're graduating people with these advanced degrees that are not qualified or can't apply what they've learned in the marketplace. I don't know about you, but I would rather sit with him and listen to him at sure. his feet and be like, okay, Keith, just talk into my recorder and figure it out, then sit with my face buried in a Fashion 101 book right. and then try to get a job, and you're not even qualified for an internship. So in the space of that, I think, you know, it just goes, it just goes to say how valuable the information and all your years of experience really are. I just want to touch on one more story. Yes, jump for baby. <laughs> You understand now, uh -oh. as you were, uh -oh. as you were. Uh -oh. <laughs> so it's a little rivalry here. No, you no, no, no. It's, 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 no, no, that's my dude. He understands now. Right. He's in my, he's he's in my he's seat now. He's in my seat now. Now I look up at him, he's like, yeah. <laughs> I just want to like, make a point for what you said. Absolutely. Because one year we went to go speak at Grand Nights University. And me and, and mm -hmm. Actually, all four of us went and we got broken up. So me and Jay went to the classroom. And Damon and Carl into another classroom, but we had this this um, this teacher, professor, or something. You know, he came in and he was speaking to the kids. Now everybody, we sit up there, we're waiting and we're falling asleep. So I <laughs> looked up at the class and half of the class was asleep, and what he was saying was just right. they just was rambling on and on and on. And I was like, well, I was trying to catch what he said. I was like, what the, you know? And I'm trying to write down notes, and then after a while, I was like, man, I don't know what he was just saying. I don't understand what he's talking about. Right. But at the end, when he, when he finally said, okay, thank you, everybody was like, oh, <laughs> get out of here. And then I'm thinking, okay, he just put the whole class to sleep. You know, so I had to get up. And I get up, and I was like, all right, now I'm going to shake this off. Now everybody, come on now, give me. But when I started to talk, everybody got up. And they, they wanted to hear what I had to say. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, if you have something interesting, people don't want to hear what you have to say. If not, of course. Yeah. Like this and one. their parents are paying yeah. thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars for that. And I think just the saddest piece of it is that how do you translate that book knowledge into the marketplace? And that's where the gap has taken place. So I actually look forward to 
placing you on college campuses throughout the country and internationally because I think your story is so profound and it has so much to say. So thank you for coming out and thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Enjoy yourself. We've got more beverages in the back and it's available for pictures for anybody that was hey Carl, I'm glad to see you. Thank you for coming. He's waving in the back. Comes to all of our dates in the speaker series. So thank you so much for coming. Um, but yeah, he's available. You're you know, talk to people here. Um, any business deals, I do get my check. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. I'm a I get my point. So any side deals that take place, I'll make the check out the side round. Duly noted. Yeah, right. Duly noted. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. He's going to be here. Stick around for a little while to take pictures, to talk with people. I'll be here. I've got information about my company. So, you know, the goal here is, and even if you're not in a position to book him, I'm sure everybody in here knows somebody, a college professor, a friend, a nonprofit organization, somebody's in a fraternity that can bring him in to share his message. So my contact information is readily available, and I will gladly um, take that phone call. <laughs> so thank you for coming out tonight, and we'll be here for a little while longer. Thank you. Awesome.